Today I want to take you into the Bible and bring you a study on the subject of three things about Israel and Bible prophecy that you must know. Uh, if you have followed us for any length of time, uh, I have taught you over and over and over in the subject of eschatology and Bible prophecy the significance of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. I have also warned you against a teaching oftentimes uh, referred to, it uh, deals with, and I don't want to uh, baptize you in theological terms, but there are groups of people who believe that God has done away with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. It is oftentimes referred to as replacement theology. And they call it replacement theology because uh, these individuals with their spurious teaching uh, believe that because Israel rejected Christ, that God replaced them with the church and that Israel has forfeited her place and her covenant in God's dealings, and that is simply uh, poor teaching. As a matter of fact, if you listen to anyone who minimizes Israel and the Jewish people and their place in Bible prophecy, then I would warn you to uh, erase and delete that teacher uh, from your list of trusted sources. So I want to state right up front as we begin that Israel and the Jewish people are the centerpiece of Bible prophecy. And today we're going to do a study, three things about Israel and Bible prophecy that you must know. Uh, go into your Bible with me into the book of Amos. Amos is one of the uh, minor prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, again, as a student of the scriptures, we have minor prophets and major prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, never confuse the fact that some are called major prophets because their message is more important. Major prophets are called major prophets in theology simply because their books are longer in content. Minor prophets are called minor prophets because their books are smaller in content. And so in the book of Amos, chapter 9, go to verse 11, and I'm going to read down through verse 15. Reading today out of the New Living Translation. In that day, I will restore the fallen house of David. I will repair its damaged walls. From the ruins I will rebuild it and restore its former glory. And Israel will possess what is left of Edom and all the nations I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken and he will do these things. Verse 13, the time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Then the terraced vineyards on the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine. I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands. Pause right there, and I want you to highlight that in your Bible. Incredibly important promise of God. In verse 14, I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands, and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again. They will plant vineyards and gardens, and they will eat their crops and drink their wine. I will firmly plant them there in their own land. Highlight that. In their own land, they will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Three things about Israel and Bible prophecy you must know. 
If you're a serious student of the Bible, you must know these three things about Israel. Let's take a moment to pray together. Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, we humble our hearts before you and before the audience of people that will gather around this subject. I pray that by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you will grant wisdom and knowledge and understanding and guide us in these moments together. I pray for every single person who listens that you would keep them ever ready for the soon coming of Christ. May none who follow this ministry be lost in eternity's morning. May they receive the challenge to turn from sin and turn to Christ while there is yet time. And I pray for those who may be listening who have never made their own personal commitment to the Lord at the end of our study together when we pray what many people call a sinner's prayer. Give them the faith and the courage and the humility to say yes to God today and no to sin. May today be a time when lives are changed. And for your honor and for your glory, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Uh, in today's study, we're going to focus uh, not just upon a subject in Bible prophecy, but one of the most significant subjects in Bible prophecy. And of course, it focuses this is around the nation of Israel. I believe every serious student of the Bible must understand at least three things about Israel and about God's covenant with Israel and the Jewish people because if you are unaware of the three things that I'm going to be teaching today, it will pollute your understanding on many subjects and issues within the parameters of Bible prophecy. One Bible scholar wrote this, quote, Keep your eyes on Zion, God's holy land. As the Jews go, so goes the world. The Jews are God's yardstick, God's outline, God's blueprint, for what he is up to in the rest of the world, end quote. Let me give you some important facts about Israel that highlight exactly how important she has been in our history. Uh, first of all, Israel is the only country in the entirety of the world that still has the same name, is located in the same land, and speaks the same language as it did 3,000 years ago. Israel also contains the lowest geographic point on the entire globe, and that would be the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is 1,330 feet below sea level and lies at the southern end of the Jordan Valley. Uh, some of you are aware of the fact, others may not be, that the salinity and the mineral content in the waters of the Dead Sea are 8.6 times greater than any ocean. It is so filled with mineral content that it's impossible to sink. And uh, if you Google the Dead Sea and tourists, you will see many people that go to the Holy Land They'll go to the Dead Sea and they usually take a break and they allow people to swim uh, or to uh, take pictures. And you'll see people like corks floating in the waters of the Dead Sea. The Mount of Olives in Israel is the oldest continuously used cemetery in the entire world. Uh, the first personal computer from IBM was designed in Israel. The first cell phone, I mean cell phones today dominate our culture, but few people understand that the cell phone was actually invented in Israel. Voicemail technology was invented in Israel. USB technology and thumb drives 
that are common in the workplace today were invented in Israel. Uh, some of you have used uh, an application called Waze, which is a very famous GPS navigation uh, app, and that was invented in Israel. The Iron Dome was invented in Israel, which is a mobile air defense system that stops short and uh, long-range missiles and is considered to be one of the most advanced military technologies ever invented. Uh, very few people understand how much Israel is hated. About uh, a thousand bombs a day on average are lobbed into Israel and the Iron Dome stops almost without exception every single one. Israel has also invented a list of weapons and military technology that would take me hours to read. The same could be said of medicines and medical technology. Most of the listeners have heard of Bear Aspirin or the Bear Medical Company. And Mr. Bear was a Jew from Israel. Almost all major high-tech technology companies, including Google and Apple and Intel and Microsoft and on and on, all have a major corporate presence in Israel. Let's get right into the heart of our study. Three things about Israel and Bible prophecy that you must know. And if you're taking notes, number one, Israel is the most important land in Bible prophecy and the world. I'll repeat that. Israel is the most important land in Bible prophecy and the world. Did you know that Israel is the geographical center of the entire globe, strategically located at the hub of three continents? Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse 5, the Bible says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is an illustration of what will happen to Jerusalem. I placed her at the center of the nations. How large is Israel? This diminutive land called Israel is only 8,630 square miles, or by comparison for those of us that live in the USA, it's smaller than the state of New Jersey. Only three states in the United States are smaller than Israel, and that would be Connecticut and Rhode Island and Delaware. The entire nation of Israel could be placed within the boundaries of the United States 463 times. Inside Canada, 478 times. Inside Russia, 765 times. Inside China, 429 times. In the state of Alaska, you could fit Israel 77 times. In the state of Texas, 33 times, and in my home state of Maine, over four times. Very few people understand how small Israel really is, and the comparison of Muslim nations that surround Israel, all of which are committed to the elimination of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. I have a picture of this small state of Israel and then all of the Muslim countries that surround it because I want you to have a visualization as to her enemies and the number in mass. Israel is that small landmass in red at the center of that slide and all of the nations in green represent Muslim countries who hate the Jews and hate Israel and are committed to the complete elimination of both the land and its occupants. But God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham and his descendants, and God promised to give them a land that would be theirs forever. In the very first book of the Bible, 
Uh, turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. And go down to verse 18. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. In this passage, God made a covenant or an irrevocable contract with Abraham. He repeats in the scripture repeatedly that this covenant is irrevocable and it is eternal. Uh, in Genesis chapter 17, God tells Abraham, Sarah, your wife, Genesis chapter 17 and verse 19, if you're taking notes, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac, and I will maintain my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring to come. You see, God had prom promised Abram and Sarah a promised child. His name eventually would be Isaac. But like many people, they were impatient and could not wait and got involved in trying to help God along. And Sarah suggested that Abram take one of the concubines. And so he did. And a baby was born, but it was not God's promised child. And that child's name was Ishmael. Isaac was the promised child. And eventually God in mercy fulfilled his covenant with them. And the birth of Isaac was the fulfillment of that covenant and the land covenant and the blessing covenant and so on. But God had mercy and he said, I'm going to bless Ishmael because it was Abram's seed. I'm going to bless Ishmael, but Ishmael and Isaac will forever be at odds with one another. Now, I'm not going to teach on it today, but it's incredibly important that you understand that all of the Arab nations and the Muslim nations are connected to the lineage of Ishmael. And of course, the Jewish bloodline comes out of Isaac. And so when the angel prophesied that Ishmael and Isaac would be at war with one another, from the moment of their birth and throughout history, their seed, you now have a biblical and prophetic understanding as to why there is this incredibly abrasive uh, war, uh, hatred, between the Muslim people, the Arab people oftentimes, and the Jews. They missed God. And any time you miss God or get ahead of God, God has mercy. But there are always consequences to disobeying God. There are always consequences to getting ahead of God. And it is always much wiser to wait patiently upon God the Lord. In Genesis chapter 17 verses 20 and 21, God promised to bless Ishmael. The ancestors of the Muslims said that he would create from Ishmael a great nation, but his covenant to Abraham, including the land covenant, was exclusively given to Isaac, not Ishmael. Be sure you have that in your life notes. God's covenant rested with Abraham and Isaac his seed. Though Ishmael was born out of the will of God, God promised to bless him. Think in terms of oil. The descendants of Ishmael uh, pretty much have the major stake of oil throughout the world, wealthy beyond belief, but they are not God's promised people. One scholar wrote this, quote, Massive amounts of archaeological evidence support the notion that Israel has been in its land for as long as the Bible recounts and that the words of Scripture are historically 
true, end quote. Uh, we know that the Jews had a presence in the land of Israel until the Romans conquered it. However, the Jews were ultimately driven from that promised land. In uh, the academic world, it is oftentimes called, and it's important that you hear this, because if you study Israel and you study Bible prophecy, sooner or later you're going to come across the term diaspora one and diaspora two. And it simply means exiled. And there were two distinct times when the Jewish people were exiled from their land. Uh, the first diaspora, diaspora one, was A.D. 70. In A.D. 70, Titus from Rome led his soldiers and the Romans conquered Israel, conquered Jerusalem, burned the temple, and drove the Jews throughout the world. Uh, Diaspora II occurred in A.D. 135. And again, the Jews were driven from the land. I want you to see the satanic plan throughout history to break the covenant of God. That's what sin and Satan and demonic influence ultimately are always targeting in your life. The power of sin and Satan and demonic influence is always to drive you away from God always to drive you away from the promises of God, always to cause you to violate what God had intended for your best life and for his divine destiny for you. And in the moments to come, as I always do, if you're listening and you're not sure where you stand with God, maybe you do not have a right relationship with God, maybe you're living in victory over sin, maybe sin is living in victory over you. But if you're not sure where you stand with God today, I never do any Bible studies, regardless of the subject and content, without taking time to pray with you at the end. And I want you to be patient. Many of you perhaps have never prayed what many people call a sinner's prayer. And today is your day to get back into right covenant with God. And so in your notes, I want you to have those uh, two dispersions down. Diaspora 1, Diaspora 2. D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A. Diaspora 1, Diaspora 2. Diaspora 1, A.D. 70. Diaspora 2, A.D. 135. Did you know that there are over 1,000 verses in the Hebrew Bible connecting the Jewish people with the land of Israel? The land of Israel. We're talking about three things every Bible student must know about Israel in Bible prophecy. Number one, the land of Israel is the most important location on the earth and in Bible prophecy. Number two, Jerusalem is the most important city in Bible prophecy and the world. Number one, Israel is the most important land in Bible prophecy in the world. Number two, Jerusalem is the most important city in Bible prophecy and the world. The most important city in the world is not Washington, D.C. It's not London. It's not Paris. It's not Rome. It's not Beijing or Moscow or any other major city on the globe. The most important city in Bible prophecy and the world is none other than Jerusalem. God declared, don't miss this, God declared in Bible prophecy that Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel over 3,000 years ago. And he prophesied that it would be their capital 
forever. Uh, I want you to see a remarkable passage of Scripture. Go into the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 132. Psalm 132. And go down to verses 13 and 14. Psalm 132, verses 13 and 14. For the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. He has desired it for his home. This is my resting place forever, he said. I will live here, for this is the home I have desired. And this is one of multiple passages in the Bible that makes it clear that God has handpicked Jerusalem. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. He has desired it for his home. This is my resting place forever, he said. I will live here, for this is the home I have desired. You don't need to go to seminary to try to figure out what God said in Psalm 132. Historically, Jerusalem became the capital of Israel by the decree of King David about 3,000 years ago based on his understanding of God's own choice. It's also interesting in your notes that Israel has remained as the capital, Jerusalem, the capital of Israel ever since. And many nations throughout history have conquered it, have settled there, have persecuted the Jews, have driven them out, etc. But did you know that all of the nations who have ever conquered that land and settled there, not one single empire, not one single nation ever made Jerusalem their capital. And over the past 2,000 years, even during times of occupation and persecution, a Jewish community has always resided there and maintained it as their eternal capital. The Bible mentions Jerusalem more than any other city or place or geographical location in the entirety of your Bible. Jerusalem is mentioned over 800 times in your Bible. And the Bible prophesied that Jerusalem would be not only the capital city of Israel, pay careful attention, Jerusalem will not only be the capital city of Israel, but God has promised that in final end time prophecy, when the dust settles, and God creates a new heaven and a new earth, Jerusalem will then be the capital of the entire world. And a lot of people in Bible prophecy perhaps have bypassed that or have not taught you that, but please be sure to have that in your notes. Jerusalem has been promised by God to be his dwelling place his home forever. He prophesied it would be the capital of Israel. And when he creates the new heaven and the new earth, Jerusalem at that time will become the capital of the world. Uh, let's go into the book of Isaiah chapter 2. And let me show that to you. Isaiah chapter 2. And go down to verses 2 through 4. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house, which is Jerusalem, will be the highest of all. The most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. 
the Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. And after the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation, Jerusalem will actually become the seat of authority from which Jesus Christ will personally rule and reign. Luke chapter 1 and verse 32. Luke chapter 1 and verse 32. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. Luke records that as David ruled and reigned from Jerusalem, that Jesus Christ, after his second coming, will establish his throne there, and Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem, not just the capital of Israel, but after the second coming of Christ, Jerusalem becomes the capital of the entire world. Lastly, number three. Number one, Israel is the most important land in Bible prophecy and the world. Number two, Jerusalem is the most important city in Bible prophecy and the world. And number three, and incredibly significant, the regathering of the Jewish people to Israel is the most important prophecy in all of the Bible. Let me say it again for those who take notes. The regathering of the Jewish people to Israel is the most important prophecy in the world and in the Bible. And since it is the most important prophecy in your Bible, let me give it to you a third time. I really don't want you to miss this. The regathering of the Jewish people to Israel is the most important prophecy in the Bible. It can be found in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, it can be found in the book of Ezekiel. It can be found in the book of Zechariah and several other passages. But uh, let, me, let me at least give you one for sake of time. Go into the Old Testament, into uh, the book of Jeremiah, and go to the 30th chapter and the third verse. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3. For the time is coming when I will restore the fortunes of my people of Israel and Judah. I will bring them home to this land that I gave to their ancestors, and they will possess it again. I, the Lord, have spoken. Don't miss this. The prophecy of God, the prophecy of Scripture, the prophecy of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zechariah, and other passages all promise that the most significant prophecy to be fulfilled as a sign of the last days is the regathering of the Jewish people supernaturally, magnetically drawn from their exiled locations and brought back to Israel. Two momentous things must happen before the end time prophecies can be fulfilled. Now, I don't have time to go down the list in the chronology of the end time prophecies. Uh, I have other teachings on our YouTube channel, on our podcast channel, uh, on Facebook. Avail yourself of those teachings. Uh, we make them available to you absolutely free of charge. But 
I want to be sure that you understand that there are two momentous prophecies that have to be fulfilled before end time prophecies. And again, study when you get a chance our Bible study on the difference between the last days and the end times. They are not synonymous. They refer to two specific seasons in Bible prophecy. But the two momentous things that must happen before the unfolding of the end time prophecies, number one, Israel must be a nation. Well, many of you that are listening to me, it occurred during your lifetime. May 14th, 1948, the promise of God, the prophecies of the prophets were fulfilled and Israel became a recognized nation. The statehood of Israel, official, May 14th, 1948. 11 minutes after the official paperwork was signed, the first nation to stand by the statehood of Israel was the United States of America. 11 minutes after they signed the paperwork, and it took some time, obviously, back in that era for news to travel, but the American president and the United States of America was the first nation to stand by Israel. Now, you remember I told you that Israel is the most important land in Bible prophecy in the world, and Israel became a nation May 14, 1948. Do you remember what happened under our former president on May 14, 2018, 70 years to the day? Jerusalem was officially recognized by the United States and several allied nations as the capital, the official capital of Israel. Significant. May 14, 1948, Israel becomes a nation. May 14, 2018, 70 years to the day, Jerusalem is recognized by our president and several allied nations as the official capital of Israel. So number one, Israel must become a nation. We're talking about two momentous things in Bible prophecy that have to be fulfilled before the final chapter, the final prophecies are fulfilled. Secondly, the Jewish people must return to their land. Now, the first momentous prophecy has already been fulfilled. Israel must be reborn as a nation. That took place. That has been fulfilled, May 14th, 1948. The second most significant prophecy, now this is called the super sign. Most notable scholars of eschatology and Bible prophecy refer to the regathering of the Jewish people as the super sign of all Bible prophecy. And the question is, have the Jewish people returned to the land of Israel? Is that a historic, provable fact? Because there are a lot of people that will say, if you could take me into the Bible and show me any single prophecy that could be proven with historic data and not some spiritual application, maybe I'd believe it. Well, friends, anybody that says that obviously has never studied the Bible. I could take hours and days and weeks to walk you through the Bible and show you Bible prophecies that have been fulfilled in exactness. Bible prophecy is so accurate. It is history written before it takes place. And we can prove that the regathering of the Jewish people, remember Diaspora 1, A.D. 70, Diaspora 2, A.D. 135, Jews exiled and driven throughout the globe. But Bible prophecy clearly tells us that the Jewish people will be gathered back to Israel. If we had time, we'd go into Ezekiel chapter 37, 
And uh, I believe verses 1 through 14, Ezekiel gives us the prophecy of the valley of dead bones. And the prophecy of Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, the bones are brought together in stages. It is a prophecy that shows us that Israel being reborn and regathered is not going to take place instantaneously in one miraculous event, but the prophecy of the rebirth of the nation of Israel, the regathering of the Jewish people is going to take place in several stages. And that prophecy of Ezekiel in the 37th chapter, verses 1 through 14, is exactly what history has recorded. Some trace the beginning of this return as early as 1871 when for spiritual reasons a handful of Jews felt compelled to go back to this land and they were persecuted, they were hated, they knew that it could be their actual lives. By 1881 about 25,000 Jewish people had settled in the land. By 1841 uh, excuse me, 1914, 80,000 Jews had regathered to Israel. By 1939, there were almost 450,000 Jews regathered in the land. After World War II, the atrocities of Hitler's Holocaust brought international attention to the plight of the Jews and the Jewish people. And of course, we know that in the aftermath of that, Israel was reborn in 1948. At the time of Israel's statehood, the population of Jews was about 650,000. Again, recall what I've already gone over, the prophecy of Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14, the valley of dry bones gathered together brought back muscle, sinew, miraculously in stages. And that's exactly what we see throughout history. But by 2009, and this is important in your notes, write this down. By 2009, there were 5.4 million Jews in Israel. Why is 2009 and 5.4 million Jews so significant to Bible prophecy? because it became the first time in Jewish history prior to their dispersion in AD 70, Diaspora 1, it became the first time in Jewish history, 2009, that there were now more Jews in Israel than any other place in the world. There were about 5. 4 million Jews in Israel, and about 5.2 million Jews in America, most of those in the greater New York City area. And it remains that way today. Now, the numbers have changed. But as I speak, as you're listening, this super sign of the regathering of the Jewish people throughout the earth is taking place before your very eyes, and some of you are not even aware as to how significant it is. Now, you have to remember that some of the numbers that I'm about to give you are fluid. So if the Lord tarries and you listen to this teaching uh, in six months or a year or two years or so on, these numbers will have changed. But as I speak today, in August of 2022, there are about 9.5 million who live in the land of Israel. That includes over 7 million Jews. Again, if you're taking notes, let me repeat it so you'll have time to jot it down because it's significant. As I speak, numbers are fluid, but as I speak, the population of Israel is about 9.5 million over 7 million of that number are Jews, which is 74% of the population of Israel. There are about 2 million Arabs who live in Israel, which is 21% currently of their population. 
and the other groups make up less than 5%. But the number of Jews, don't miss this, the number of Jews that have immigrated to Israel in the past year, in the past year, represents the largest number of Jewish immigrants around the world fleeing back to Israel in over 20 years. That's significant. This is Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14, and the regathering and the reestablishment of the Jewish nation and the Jewish people and God's covenant to them, guaranteed, you're watching it take place before your very eyes. And in the last year, more immigrants have returned, Jewish immigrants have returned to Israel than at any point in the last 20 years. Some of you perhaps have not connected the dots with what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I humbly challenge you. You need to listen. If you are a student of the Bible. I say this often, and I say it lovingly. You cannot be a serious student of the Bible and fail to be a serious student of Bible prophecy. And I humbly ask you to allow me to be a trusted source in these last days to walking you through Bible prophecy, and here's one of the reasons why. Perhaps for most of you, no one has taught you that what's going on in Russia with Vladimir Putin and the Ukraine and the war that goes on there as I speak. Did you know that Ukraine had a large population of Jews? And the war with Russia against Ukraine has caused the Jewish people of Ukraine to flee to Israel said it before, I'll say it again. In the last year, we have seen more Jewish people around the world coming back to Israel than at any point in the last 20 years. The number of Jews in Israel is expected to reach 13.2 million Jews in the next 10 years. Friends, there are only, again, numbers are fluid, but as I speak, there are approximately 15 million Jews in the world. In the next 10 years, not Christian sources, not Christian polls, but Jewish agencies, international agencies, are predicting that of the 15 million Jews that are on the face of the earth, over 13.2 million of them are going to be living in Israel. That, my friend, is a literal, historic, provable fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And again, I bring you back, two momentous things must happen before end-time prophecies begin to unfold. The final prophecies begin to unfold. What are they? Israel has to be reborn as a nation, fulfilled. The Jews have to supernaturally be regathered. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, systematically and literally regathered from around the world. That, my friend, has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled as we speak. So there you have it in our study today the three most important things about Israel and Bible prophecy that you need to know. Number one, Israel is the most important land in Bible prophecy in the world. Number two, Jerusalem is the most important city in Bible prophecy and the world. And number three, the regathering of the Jewish population from around the world has to be fulfilled before the final ticking of final prophecy begin to unfold at a rapid pace. And that also is being fulfilled as I speak. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Over 400 times in the Bible we are promised the soon return of Christ. 
And friend, there is nothing more important in all of the world than being ready to meet the Lord. Heaven is real. Hell is real. Eternity is real. Once you are born, you forever will be. And God has done everything in his power to reach you with his eternal word, his love, his forgiveness. He gave his only son. Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood for my sin, for your sin. You might ask, Tiff, what do I need to do to get right with God in these last days? Three things. Number one, you have to recognize your sin. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. And number three, you have to receive Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't know how. Will you pray with me? Some of you that will pray with me, it may be the very first time. Others of you, and I'm not judging, but for some reason you've wandered away from God. And today you need to come home. When you're done praying with me, I plead with you. I want you to go to our website. It's on the screen, lostlamb.org. And I want you to click on New Beginnings. And will you write me a brief email and just say, Tiff, today as I was listening to the Bible study with you, I prayed that prayer at the end. I want to be ready to meet the Lord. I want to know my sins are forgiven and forgotten. And today I prayed with you, and I want to be ready. You need to do that. Pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. And today I want to be a real Christian. I want to live ready in these last days to meet the Lord. I recognize my sin and I repent. I am willing in childlike faith to turn my back on sin and turn my heart to Jesus. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I vow this day I will live for you in place of my weakness. Give me your strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me to be what you want me to be. As of this day, I am no longer the property of sin. I am today a child of God and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.